Hi, and thank you for downloading episode number 19 of the Radio Juxtapose podcast. My name is Doug Gillen, and in this episode, Evan is out in Japan at the Beautiful Losers Riker show, and he is in conversation with the sign painting, graffiti, fine art legend, Steve Espo Powers. If you were itching to get into that interview, then skip forward to about minute 10. If not, you can sit back and listen to me and Evan talk about the significance of that particular period and that time of those beautiful losers. Enjoy the episode. What are we, what, what are we, what are we talking about today? Evan, you've just come back from Japan. Yeah, I wish I could say that my trips to Japan have actually encompassed the the country at large, but I've only been to Tokyo, and it's been like the tenth time I've been just to Tokyo, and I'm really itching to go somewhere else. But um, that said, shout out to Ruka and the Ruka crew for uh, hosting me during the Ruka World Tour, which included, amongst other things, uh, a bit of a refresh recharge of the famous beautiful losers uh group show so it was very it was cool because um to hang out with uh espo ed templeton deanna templeton barry mcgee alexis ross the smith street tattoo boys um it was it was a cool week for sure uh, I didn't realize that people don't go to Tokyo in August because it's so bloody hot, so hot. I like that. Like that use. I like of, that. Mainly like that use of you, bloody. Is that right? Yeah, that's a good way. Whatever we no, you de- oh you you just de- you devalued it there. You're like, was that was that the right use? Of oh, that I should just I should have held it. Like, should just held it's it. It's like last night was is it, is it lit? Is is that is that what the kids are is saying? That, is that, that? Was is last that... night was it lit? I, I I'm not too sure. Was it light? It was one of them. I had to admit to some people in in, in Tokyo. Uh, I've never heard the the little Nas X song. Oh, this is amazing! This is amazing. We're both culturally uh, like uh, on on the same on the same page here. It's it's like just I keep reading about it, and I'm like oh, I've got to go listen to that song because it's been at like number one for a year and a half or whatever the right. hell. Right. You know, like the record breaking blockbuster number one song. I've never heard it. Okay, good. I've I'm never glad. Heard it once. I'm glad because it felt a little bit. Was it like was it an age thing? Have I now officially hit the age where like they, I miss things? I know what it is. I know it's cultural relevance. I watched a video recently where Ken Burns talked about how it's like the most amazing thing ever. I just haven't listened to it. I'm going to see how long I can go. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like I it, there's a clear cultural moment that so many people are getting involved with and I'm just like, eh, I'm going to I'm going to sit this one out. You guys you guys go for it. Do you, you have, have any that. do you have anything else like that in your life where it's a it's the billion dollar thing and you're just, you have no idea you have not participated at all i've um i've never seen the lord of the rings movies Ooh, okay or, or the harry potter there. movies star wars for me never seen star wars really none of them Didn't not even the first three nah none of them actually this is this kind of ties in because i hadn't seen beautiful losers until okay we had a, we had a conversation once at new art and i was kind of like you know, we were just, it was just one of those, you know, late night conversations that we were having. And it was just you kind of fanboying on Barry McGee. And you're like, blah, 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 blah. and then I was like, okay, I got home. <laughs> Is that I how he like, sounded? That's how he sounded. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went home and I purchased a real copy of, uh, of the film. And then I, I was like, okay, cool. I, I, you know, I, yeah, this is, I, I need this. This is such a key piece right. of the timeline of right. this scene. How could I ever speak of this scene without having seen this film and understanding that period? Well, I mean, the thing is, you had spoke on that scene before because it's like it's so influential and it's such a defining kind of connector between what underground culture was and how it was going to connect, like what the bridge was going to be to the contemporary art world. It kind of set the standard, especially for the things that you and I in this podcast and probably all the readers of Juxpos are into. Skateboarding, graffiti, music, 
tattoo culture. I mean, all of it, 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 it's so pivotal because it put a name on it. And granted, I don't know if everybody likes the name of it, but it, it is a kind of like, a, it's an indicator. I mean, there's these things like super flat, beautiful losers, uh, the, you know, the Banksy, Santa's ghetto, that whole Santa's scene. Ghetto. Yeah. yeah. Like there's just like these cultural, little cultural, historical moments in the timeline. Absolutely. I mean, especially, and even for like juxtapose, it's like the psychedelic posters of San Francisco, the skate culture of Los Angeles in the seventies. There's like these little things and beautiful losers is kind of like this interesting connecting point actually of all of it. And it's, everybody's kind of gone on to become iconic in their own way. So, and then it was actually kind of nice in this case talking to Espo because he um, he's such a kind of a pivotal figure in so many ways, but also has stayed pretty true to like what he's what he's all always been about. Um, and I thought he had some pretty illuminating things to say, and it was pretty candid. And I, I enjoyed I really enjoyed talking to him. The conversation itself was done at seven thirty in the morning in a phone booth. <laughs> In, yeah, what, what describe because you actually didn't really do it at the in the interview. Describe where that okay, where that all was conducted. Well, because there was, I, I'm going to be honest with you, the whole thing, and and you guys are going to listen to this in in just a minute. It feels like it it feels like the other side rather than 7:30 having having just got up. It feels like 7:30 we've been out and we're now the last <laughs> two that are sitting up and we found a little spot and we're just like two giggling schoolgirls. Yeah, well that's kind of I mean in a way that's kind of how it was. I we we had kept pushing back this interview and finally like we got to do this. So we woke up at 7 a.m. we're like let's meet in the hotel, let's do this and Steve had this great idea of a phone phone booth in the in the lobby of the actually the basement of the of the hotel would be a really good place to do this interview. It it was so hot in that room. I was just dripping sweat. He was cool as a cucumber. I mean, it was amazing. He was able to keep it together. Um, but we just needed a quiet spot to record, and um, we didn't really. It's not that people in Japan are suspicious, but I think if two guys decided to pull out some microphones in the middle of the lobby, it would have like maybe set off some a little bit some alarms. So we tried to be incognito. Um, but it actually ended up being kind of perfect because. Steve always has a little bit of a, um, he's a very unique fellow. So it just felt like it was a very unique experience to kind of, to, to do it in in that place and in that way. Um, and it was kind of after all the beautiful losers show and stuff had ended. So it was kind of like the, the last waning parts of the week. Yeah. I mean, I, I think he's, he's got such an interesting persona around on the character and his energy, but I, I, it's one of these things where you can kind of like look at someone and you could almost write them off as a caricature, but actually everything that he says is, it's kind of brilliant. Yeah. And I, there were some things that he was, you know, alluding to and talking about that I thought were interesting, but I like the fact that he's kind of made this move into like institutional, art world he just did this installation at san francisco museum um, of modern art that's up i think uh, through the end of the year it's just like this really cool sign painting meets fine art installation and he did that at the brooklyn museum as well i think it was a little more in depth there but i like that he's become in like sort of a in situ contemporary artist now and i think that curators are noticing it and uh it's a needed um it's perfect for the instagram world even though it existed long before the instagram world like the the words and the phrases that he comes up with i think it's so perfect he just kind of sat back and waited for the world to catch up yeah and um he's from philadelphia he's lived in new york for years done books he's done major public art projects he's a beautiful loser he's an icy signs sign painter i think there's just a lot to him that uh is fascinating and i love the fact that he was there with this with his family so that kind of um it was like a different side of him uh it was, it was just the whole the week was great but in this in particular this conversation i thought was really um, i was really happy that we uh we woke up early and did it i feel like i'm like jim nance at the masters like this is Saturdays with Espo. Hello, friends. That would, be, that would be actually really great. Can we do this completely in golf talk? Yeah, in golf I mean, narration? I think in order not to get kicked out of this hotel, we might have to. That's important. <laughs> what is the weirdest thing that you've seen in Tokyo this week? 
Oh, last night I was in a cab and there's videos playing in the cab. We have them in New York, but these cab videos are in the, the headrest. So you have an iPad directly in your face. And I usually ignore the ads, <laughs> but I caught one little bit of text on a screen and I backed up the video, shot the, the screen, and what it said was, in English, we are using facial recognition technology for basically for gender-based advertising or gender gender targeted advertising. Wait, this was in English? This was in English okay. as like a statement on the screen in the back of the cab. Okay, so yesterday walking to uh, Aaron's talk, Aaron Rhodes' talk, a gentleman who looked like the hunchback of Notre Dame was walking, Japanese gentleman, bent over, full suit, briefcase, wandering kind of aimlessly, shouting, do not teach the children masturbation. In English. Oh, 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 I know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's famous. He's the hunchback of Nori Don. <laughs> I was like, finally, something fucking off. What's the best meal you've had here in Tokyo 2019? I had some good ramen the other day. It was zesty. <laughs> you? I have not had ramen yet. I think the best, the most memorable meal I've had so far is this slice of pizza that I had last night. <laughs> That reminded me of the pizza in my high school cafeteria. Evan, you know the 80s are big right now. Yeah, they are. It's a, there's a comeback. What was amazing was a, there is a pizza shop. People, there is a pizza, pizza shop in Tokyo where they sell pizza by the slice for 85 cents. And it tastes just like the pizza served in your high school cafeteria in 1982. And it's really close to like some fancy shops too, so you can really get yourself your Dolce & Gabbana and slice of pizza. They pay, the rent in this pizza shop is about a million dollars a month. <laughs> yeah, how are they making that? But the pizza they sell you is 85 cents a slice. Okay, when you're here, how often do you come here actually? <laughs> Hey, how often are you here? Uh, I've been here seven times. This is my third time in five years. Uh, you had the show at Target a couple years ago, right? I've, I had a show. The, I exclusively show in, in Tokyo at <laughs> Target Gallery, located in the Harajuku district. This is now your spot? It, it, it's. I conduct some business in... Uh, a phone booth in the basement of the Cerulean Tower Hotel in Tokyo. I am exclusively represented worldwide by Espo's Art World. And in Tokyo by Target Gallery on Jingume. I really like that you, you're like talking as if you're on camera, which is... Oh, that's not on? Yeah. What is that? Why are you carrying a VHS camera? Why are you carrying a VHS camera around on your shoulder? Is that some 80s thing too? By the way, why... What do you like about Tokyo? Or what do you like about Japan? It seems like it... It's like the other night, it seems like there's a good response to you. You seem like you have a good response to this place. Like what... Is there something that... Your Philly sign painting mixture works here, or is it just that the the they can the way that you write your text sort of translates well here? I think it it really comes down to pictures. Yeah. You know, I think I think because I speak in pictures and I speak in these, I speak I paint logo types, mm -hmm. I paint pictograms, um, and it relates very well to the Japanese way of depicting language. Yeah, and, for sure. And it also is, you know, characters are cute, you know? They have the cutest yeah. and most amazing design yeah. characters. And, you know, just even just everything design and otherwise, there's love and care and, and presence mm -hmm. in everything, down to the candy wrappers, up to just bridges and industrial, like, little you know 
sewer covers and just things around anything that gets touched mm -hmm. gets touched with respect yeah. and you know it's a beautiful thing it's yeah. like and it was something that when I started writing graffiti up when I started writing graffiti in Philadelphia in, in 1984 there was a sense of respect there was before I really knew anything I knew people made art or things that look like art and they were respected for it mm -hmm. and that was compelling to me because in all of the other venues for art that I had at that time there, there wasn't really that kind of respect mm -hmm. it wasn't a peer respect like the, the only respect that was being handed out was teachers might give you respect right like a compliment you know but getting respect from your teachers isn't the coolest thing in the world yeah Getting respect from your peers is the coolest thing in the world. So I entered graffiti knowing that if I did the job right, there might be respect transacted. Yeah. So, and that's, I think that was something that I found laying in the streets of Philadelphia, but it's something that Japan is built on. Right. That was a really great, uh, like, connection. Oh, you want to stand back and admire that connection? Yeah, that was pretty good. That was that was like, oh, hey. Well, in graffiti, it's all about connections. That was connections. Johnny, that was a nice putt on fifteen. <laughs> I really like the way he hooked up that S and P. I think again, there's another, this other weird thing. Even if they're not happy, people take their jobs very seriously here. I can't even understand, and I wouldn't even profess to like understand what goes on in the minds <laughs> of the guy of moving seven, traffic along. or the seven or the six the seven eleven guy or the guy who so we're in a neighborhood called shibuya this the entire city and, and its environs has 30 million people shibuya is holding three million it feels like at any time and then next year the olympics are coming to town everybody's really excited about it you know, everybody really wants to see the Japanese. Wait, are they excited about it? Everybody wants to see the Japanese. And the Japanese want to see themselves, like, solve the problem of bringing an Olympics to a city. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I see that. And using the resources in a positive way. And Japan has so much to teach the world. And everything aside with the Olympics and our cynicism about it, Japan, this is an opportunity for Japan to educate the world in, in ways of, of living and looking towards the future and embracing change and not being scared. And the Olympics are going to give them that platform. So in the middle of Shibuya, there's 18 construction sites going in amidst these tons of people walking around. So there's a Saturday night in Shibuya there were hundreds of construction security guards just in the neighborhood mm -hmm. around the construction sites just making sure drunk people don't walk into traffic and they're all you know men in their 60s they're elegantly dressed yeah or they're dressed elegantly in the uniforms that are elegant right and it's like the coolest gang of you know friends that have obviously been doing this forever and they're doing the same thing they're living the dream. They're hanging out on the streets looking at girls and boys and they're talking nonsense to each other all night long. Yeah. That's Yeah. So that to me is a model for living. I yeah. could live with I could live that life. Yeah. And then you kind of go home and you don't have to bring it with you. You kind of just I'm sure they bring it home. Well, they might bring, they might bring, <laughs> Well, I don't know if they get time off. No, maybe. You know, yeah. I think it's just it's a working life at that point, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's cool. I, yeah, I just, I really appreciate how everything here is just so well, you, and you, you articulated it, how detail oriented everything is mm -hmm. and process means something and, uh, the way things are made means something. Uh, so the show, the Ruka world tour, beautiful losers now and then, not then and now. What is like the beautiful losers mean to you? <laughs> Sorry that I feel, again, I'm feeling like Jim Nance right now. Um, how did you feel? I jump the train I like crash the scene they were having a party and I wasn't invited so I just like went in and started pouring drinks for myself 
and Aaron being a good sport and seeing eye to eye with me um you know he gave me opportunities to do stuff and and was that the first time you'd kind of done a little bit more gallery oriented I, stuff? I mean you know it was the first time i was stepping out on my own away from barry mcgee mm -hmm. and todd james and when i first started working at alleged i had energy to give um, Aaron had a place for me to, to, to put the energy and we learned a lot and the, I don't think Aaron knew, I don't think Aaron knows now that much about the art world, but he carries himself in a way where you think he knows it all. Yeah. And I know that's kind of crucial to art management right. and, and production. But Aaron, and Aaron, what I didn't, what I didn't understand at first was, Aaron's an artist, and he was, you know, the gallery presented itself as a way of like making art. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't really understand how much of an artist he was. I knew Jeffrey Deitch, and I had experience with Jeffrey Deitch, and when I met Aaron, I was like, oh, here's a, you know, okay, this is a cooler version of okay. Jeffrey. Yeah. Who smokes ciggies and drinks black coffee and you know has a gallery on the Lower East Side and he's got stories. Yeah, you know what I mean. All we were the having anything on the Lower East Side was like, you know, you anybody had anything on the Lower East Side had a problem on the Lower East Side. Yeah, you know. So, but that was the charm was, this is where I knew this is where all my friends were hanging out, and it was a short enough commute for them to show, mm -hmm. you know, at the place, but. I didn't get into the first incarn the first two incarnations of Alleged, I missed out on. And what's interesting is the third one in in on Washington Street in the Meatpacking District, Aaron got that space strictly because he had a gallery open in Japan and he was thinking Japan was gonna be such a hit that it would send money back and float his in, operation yeah. in New York. And I didn't know any of that. So what I did know was showing with Aaron in Washington Street immediately put me on the radar in Japan. So um, Aaron, you know, Aaron and I worked together for years. And it's like, it was one of those things where we had a long interesting history and but I knew regardless of the ups and downs and the ins and outs of what we were going through I knew even at the worst of it I knew we were going to be friends and it was all going to work out and I don't have that feeling with like anybody you know mm -hmm. I mean I have a feeling with that with maybe two or three people in my entire life mm -hmm. and I'm really glad it worked out with Aaron yeah you know it was like you know, it's gone wrong a couple of times, but, but with you, other people, but with Aaron Lee, but he do you, fulfilled. Do you think that's symbolic of like the Beautiful Losers thing in general? No, I mean. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, that's, that's cool. I'm glad you said that. No. Yeah. It's more about the, the Beautiful Losers thing is really interesting as a concept because it was, it was a forced, you know, marketing decision. Of course. To... Yeah. You know, let's create this group. You know, the cool school name is already taken, so let's take something else. I still think Todd James' clever honky movement is <laughs> so good and really so accurate. Um, but Beautiful Losers is really great because it defines the playground. Mm -hmm. It defines this playground space of like, it, it casts the biggest net for catching the most kids to do the next mm -hmm. things with. Mm -hmm. So in 10 years, I've seen more people who, even if they hate the movie, got power from the movie mm -hmm. to do the things that they were doing with it. You know what I mean? And that's what culture is about. Like right. it's, you know, beautiful losers lodge itself into the culture of the imagination. 
and it's doing its work. Right. You know. I mean, if you're as somebody like my age, which I'm like late thirties, um, you can't help if you're interested in any sort of art. You can't help but be influenced by your group of artists, that group of artists, because it was just it's so it was kind of your entry point. Yeah, that's too bad, huh? I know. I know. It's it's really. But then, you know, and Beyond the Streets, which is interesting, which you're into, like, kind of articulates a different part of it and longer part of it. But it's, like, again, it's got all kind of similar. It, it has its narratives that all kind of inter, interweave with each other. All these kind of outsider movements that become I, slightly mainstream. I mean, what's interesting is, you know, this, this group that I'm, the larger group that I'm associated with, that I like feel kinship with and membership with and family with starts with for me starts with Barry with starts with Barry starts with Margaret okay and it starts with like everything that was it starts with San Francisco in like ninety three it looks like mm -hmm. you know earlier for Barry like Barry was like chipping at it since it looks like eighty nine okay and you know but by the mid nineties it was like in full flower like everybody everything I needed as an artist I didn't I wasn't I wanted to be an artist since I was three years old but I wasn't gonna stop writing graffiti mm -hmm. until I saw something that said this is the way forward mm -hmm. and I knew enough from writing about graffiti and talking about graffiti that it was we were due for somebody to kind of walk into the into into history and connect all these still live wires, these various tracks of thought, trains of thought mm -hmm. that flowed through the 20th century. You know, and Barry did it. Barry like started threading it together. And yeah, it was something that like the 80s guys, 70s and 80s guys couldn't connect. It was like, it wasn't, was so it's different. not even a fair comparison. Yeah, the, yeah, the 70s and 80s guys like, they did it all. They went to the heights of it. And then the market crashed. Yeah. You know, the lifers went back to the studio and just did the work, mm -hmm. you know, which that was the most important moment in graffiti history, for graffiti art history, you know, like when the guys who were at the fun gallery or were showing and selling at Sh wherever, Shafrazi or mm -hmm. whatever the situations with Sidney Janice, you know, whatever situation, guys that sold work, tasted a bit of champagne, and then when it was gone, they went back to work. Yeah. And I'm looking at you days mm -hmm. and I'm looking at you crash and future, you know, so, and others. But those three, seeing them go back to work, you know, I connected with Futura. Futura saw my, I mailed Futura magazine and he called me on the phone at this job I had that sucked. And I got a like, you know, a spiritual blessing from on high in New York of like, hey, I like your magazine if you're ever in. Man, come by, you know, and I, I think went up the next day. <laughs> just casually yeah. dropped in, you know? Hey, I have to hey, just sweat pouring <laughs> off, day old clothes on me. But, you know, that was, that was the most important brick in the, in the wall that we're writing on now was the lifers. It was that, about the work. Yeah, the dudes that said when the cameras were off, they just kept working. Yeah. And that's that was the faith of graffiti art and it was you know i went to art school it sucked i didn't see any you know i was interested i still kind of regret it because i was interested in being like a boring fine artist i'm still interested in being a boring fine artist for example though um but i had i knew graffiti was just like had all these awesome possibilities and I was on the ground floor of something new. Yeah. But you, like, were you like, I, I, you know, I could be David Hockney. Yeah, man. Yeah. He's the one. No, no, yeah. He love, is I the love, one. I love he works stuff. in, he works in enamel, like oil-based paint and he smokes and he wears 
outrageous stuff and gets paint all over it. Like, yeah, he's and the he guy. paints all day. Yeah, he's the guy. Yeah. Um, and he paints beautifully. Yeah. But I couldn't do that. I still, you know, because graffiti was there. It was like, yeah, I could play like, you know, I don't know, boring swing music, but rock and roll just started. Yeah. And it's it's good to be here. Yeah. So, um, and even to this day, like I think about like, you know, damn, you know, painting in fields, oil paint sounds pretty good too. Yeah. But the problem with starting something new and getting into new is you have nothing really to compare it to. Right. And I'll, I'll tell you true that I think a lot of the resistance against the art world, like embracing this group of people mm -hmm. in some ways is because it's new and it doesn't jive with the rest of the narrative. Right. You know what I mean? And in order to make something new, you have to re ignore or refute the narrative and see what happens. And it's a narrative that the art world didn't write. So it's a little hard for them to uh, participate in something they feel like they're coming in to 30 years late. And they get like a little, uh, what's the word? They, it's not that they get uh, annoyed by it. I think they get a little, you know, there's this, this thing where if you went to study art history and get a PhD in writing or whatever, uh, you might feel just a little like, mm, I didn't, it's not part of, you know, it's too much I have to learn to write a criticism about it, which I don't agree with, but. Yeah, that's like, that's just too bad. I mean, I think, it's also that art's kind of receded a bit from the the conversation. Yeah. You know, it's not the influence it's ever it, it, it's been. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, you know, nobody's painting Guernica and you know, it's not Yeah. Well, maybe that's not true. I'm I'm really regretting saying a lot of this. <laughs> I know people will make me regret saying all, which is good. Yeah. Because it's for silence, so there's no... Yeah, I guess it's true. This is perfect for... It's like a... If you want to record your vocals for an album, I guess this is not bad. Yeah, I'm going to record a, a, an R&B album. <laughs> and, well, mostly blues. Yeah. No, no rhythm. Um, so, yeah, I think we're at a really... What's interesting now is we're, you know, 25 years in, um, I guess, since, like, Barry first showed at... You know, Barry showed yeah. at the Whitney, like... Right. I don't know when that was. Yeah, but. it was. I, I always look at those dates. Like that was really early. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So I guess that does make you know set. Street markets, you know, coming up on twenty years. Yeah, that's right. You know. And it, that was at Deitch's old space. It old, was at. Old um, space. It was at yeah Wooster Street. Yeah. But before that, it was in it was in Philadelphia. It was it was in a right, museum okay. in Philadelphia, the ICA. Is that who funded that? Was the ICA? And that's how you guys got to do really it? It was a really great curator named Alex Baker. And oh, to yeah. really bring this conversation back to the start, like, you know, there are people you will meet in your life that if you work as an artist, you're, you're going to meet curators. And you're going to meet people that are putting on shows. And you're going to meet dealers. And every stripe in between. And occasionally you're going to meet if you are successful it's because you met people like Jeffrey Deitch Aaron Rose um Tomoko and KG at Target Gallery yeah good shout out and it, you know so many others yeah you know so these are people that believe in in the work and they you know the the dealer, or I should say, the curator that brought us to Venice, I'm spacing on his name right now, but he's beloved, outrageously great curator. We were really blessed to have him come meet him at Deitch, and he loved the show, and he took it to Venice. So you meet these curators, and these curators will guide you, they'll lie to you, they'll <laughs> use you, manipulate you. But they'll educate. Yeah. They will tell you the truth. They will support you to the end. And you owe everything to them. Yeah. And it's nice to have relationships like that. You know? It really kind of d deepens and broadens your life immensely. Yeah. And I think that's... 
if you needed another reason to be an artist, it's to have better relationships with people. And also, the three rules you need to know about selling work in a gallery is get the money, make sure you get the money, and don't forget to get the money. That's it. That's it. The rest is details. You know, we can end on that. But one thing, the, the art of getting over is all is like one of my all time favorite art books. So I'm very happy to interview you finally. The art of getting over is 20 years old. Yeah, I know. It was like the first graffiti book that I got that I felt like it was telling a different story than what I had known before. So I always like want to thank you because that's probably what got me into doing juxtapose, which maybe I shouldn't be. I know that's good. I'll thank you for that. Yeah, you can thank me for that. Yeah, I yeah, think that's good. Yeah, and you're not like robbing people. That's true. In Japan, on the train. No, 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 I'm not. Uh, we should say thank you to Ruka for having us here. Thank you, Patrick, Michael, Tenori, and the, the entire Ruka family. It's really. Let me tell you something about that and unabridged, is that, you know. Also, as an artist, hopefully you'll meet people like Pat Tenori because above and beyond all curators, he puts his money where his mouth is. Yeah. And Pat, Pat has really stitched together a cloth, a group of people from the, his, the wide interests that motivate Pat. Absolutely. That Pat is interested in, inspired by seeks to contribute to like pat we all take from culture music art tv whatever floats your boat the things that really move you you don't have to but you could if you wanted to if you're so inclined you could give back to those mm -hmm. and you could contribute back and maybe put something in the world that wasn't there before and pat pat is an artist in his own right Pat designs and has such a smart outlook. He understands humanity in a way that few people do. He makes quality t-shirts that they can wear that reflect that humanity. And he surrounds himself with talent and strength and interesting, vibrant people. And you know, there's a lot of, you could talk a lot of funny things about lifestyle brands, but it's in really amazing to see this elegant lifestyle of Pat's yeah like he puts it together yeah and it's good it's good nourishing fashion for you to partake in and I smile personally yeah when I see people wearing Ruka yeah you know and I understand it's a piece in a much larger conglomerate you know yeah right puzzle but it's enabling Pat to do and create interesting important cultural moments i i was <clears throat> i wrote about this in juxtapose the other day that there was a bj penn signing across the street from when beautiful losers show was going to open up the other night and i just thought like only ruka could kind of pull that off and it didn't seem weird yeah it was weird. and i'm not usually like a brand like <laughs> punk, like punk like this but like it was cool it was cool yeah it's really yeah, cool i really I, I really enjoyed it thank you hey man thank you so there you go, the enigmatic, charismatic, larger-than-life Steve Espo Powers. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe to the channel and why not let us know who you would like to see us sit down and have a conversation with. Till next time.